Welcome, welcome to a brand new episode of Identity Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host, Kwame Sarfamensa. This is your first time tuning in or listening to the podcast. We welcome you, and we hope that you come back for more future episodes. And if you're a returning listener or viewer of the podcast, we welcome you back. We hope that today's episode is one that you find informative, insightful, and enlightening to your ears and or eyes. So before we bring on today's guest, I want to make a few quick announcements. Uh, first and foremost, we have our Dane Talk Apparel Shop. And currently we have some new designs for our librarians, for our STEAM educators, and all the educators in the spectrum. So if you are interested in viewing some of our newest designs, make sure you check out our shop at the Teespring store at teesprings.com backslash stores backslash the identity talk apparel shop. And then also, if you are an educator who is looking for some professional development to add to your license, uh, make sure you check us out at the identity talk school through Teachable. And we have our courses housed there, all focused on culture responsive teaching, anti-racist teaching, uh, classroom management, behavior management, lesson planning, and all the aspects of the teaching craft. So if you are interested in learning more about our programs, you can book a call with us at Countly.com backslash Identity Talk for Educators. So let's get to the main event. So tonight, uh, we're going to be talking about the AAPI community. So for those who are not familiar with the acronym, we're talking about the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And as you already know, there have been a lot of traumatic events that have happened uh, recently um, in our capital, as well as just in our country as a whole. And we want to really focus on just that community and just the different issues that are permeating um, within it, not just in the K-12 school system, but just in our society as general. So I have here a special guest who I've had the honor of working with and crossing paths with, um, you know, during my career. And he's going to come and talk to us about what is happening right now. So without further ado, I want to bring on Mr. Takiru TK Nagayoshi to the podcast. How we doing, brother? Hey, how's it going? Nice to be here, Kwame. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. It's an honor to have you. Um, so much to talk about, but before we get started, I know you know recently you're in an accident, so I want to know how you feeling. How's the recovery been? <laughs> Much better. Finally, the insurance claims are getting settled, so uh, I was totaled. My car was totaled. The whole oh truck. My goodness. Yeah, and luckily I'm safe. I'm in one piece, but a lot of the paperwork and filing reports and hoping that insurance reimburses everything, that has been a huge headache. Uh, and then just this week, I think we're getting all that cleared up. And so I'm in a pretty good place. Thanks for asking, man. Yeah, it's good to see you and it's good that you're in good spirits and in and good health from what I see. So glad to have you. So let's jump right in because we have a lot to talk about. Uh, first question I love to ask my guest is to just tell us a little bit about yourself, your upbringing, and what brought you into the education field. Yeah. Uh, so hi again, everyone. My name is Takeru Nagayoshi. I also go by TK. I'm a high school English and research teacher in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and also the 2020 Massachusetts Teacher of the Year. So in addition to being like a full-time teacher, I think I do a lot of like freelance education work. It's a lot of speaking, writing, consulting work, obviously through an educator's lens. Uh, and, you know, to the second part of what brought me here, uh, I'm not really sure if I like that question of, you know, how or what calling was it, right, that pushed you into the re uh, education field? Because, you know, the truth for me is that it's all not that inspiring. I joined the profession because I was recruited through an alternative certification program and didn't really know what else I wanted to do at 22. So I was like, cool, I'll try teaching. Um, and when I think a lot of teachers say that, you know, teaching is a calling, that never really resonated for me. And it's been a struggle with a lot of high highs and low lows. And so, for me, what's more important is just thinking through like, well, what 
the hell is then keeping me <laughs> in teaching in this <laughs> right. Um And I want to say it's like the craft, right? Being able to imbue your passion into creating engaging content, having a live audience that responds to your creation, it's pretty awesome, right? And, and I'm always trying to convince my students to become teachers. And so I tell them, it's just like being an influencer or a YouTuber. We're the OG content creators. Uh, and so that's what's inspiring me to stay in the classroom. You know, absolutely. And I know for myself, just like you, I didn't have aspirations of becoming an educator. It's just one of those things that fell in my lap, just like it happens with many of us. So I appreciate your honesty and all that and and just for sharing that, because that's usually not the case for, for many of us. But you you mentioned inspired. So that's how the two of us actually cross paths. Yeah. Um, so yeah. just to give some context, um, I used to teach in the greater Boston area at Boston Public Schools in Massachusetts. And the Inspired Fellowship is an initiative that was started by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that we call DESI here in Massachusetts, uh, where the goal was to try to diversify the workforce in the Commonwealth. So mm -hmm. we pretty much served as ambassadors uh, for the state of Massachusetts, just to let, just get people to see the value of being an educator and, and trying to bring them on, you know, into the workforce. So uh, that's how we cross paths. But, you know, you're the 2020 state teacher of the year, you know, in Massachusetts. So what I want to know is, and you started to touch on it as you were sharing, you know, what brought you to the field. How has your life changed personally and professionally since being given that honor? So just kind of walk us through what life is like now, because I know it's a lot more um, responsibilities that are on your plate. Yeah, uh, it certainly feels like it, right? Uh, I like to think of it as I'm doing the things that I've always done, but with a platform and so kind of being intentional with how I'm communicating the things that I've always done in my classroom. Uh, and being teacher of the year is like being a teacher, it's like having teacher influencer clout uh, and the most gratifying part about it is how I've been able to connect with so many incredible educators and always be constantly at the forefront of these conversations that are taking place in the education landscape, the education policy space, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I've gotten an opportunity to connect with a lot of cool people. Um, my year of service was <laughs> canceled by the pandemic. And so uh, obviously with some of its limitations, but uh, I've been able to you know, be part of virtual town halls with Congressman and presidential candidate Seth Moulton. We talked about how we can support uh, students through an equity and social emotional lens. Uh, I was a guest speaker at a Federal Reserve event on how racism in the economy intersects with education. Um, I was in a brainstorming session with a tech billionaire who I'm not allowed to name, uh, but he wanted to know what education would look like in a hundred years. And so all these like weird, odd jobs and opportunities and cool spaces that I get to be a part of uh, has been one of the more gratifying aspects of, of, of this work. Um, but I will say, even when I am in these spaces, uh, I always see it as an opportunity to elevate the prestige of the teaching profession. Uh, I read a tweet the other day uh, and it went something along the lines of like, certain professions are called heroes because uh, it allows us as a society to honor them without paying them or giving them the respect that they actually deserve. Uh, and I think the truth is that teachers fall under this category, right? And so when I'm invited to speak or, you know, be uh, on TV or the radio, oftentimes I feel like it's for like feel good ceremonial content, you know, cutesy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and they expect us to say these inspirational platitudes and smile. And so when I show up in these spaces, and when I'm unapologetic with a clear vision of what I want for it to be changed in education, what kind of advocacy work that I want to see done. And when you're prepared and well-informed and prove how educators need to be reckoned with, people are pleasantly surprised, right? Uh, and it shouldn't be that way because teachers are professionals. We have valid expertise because we live in the intersection of uh, practice and policy. And it's our experience in the classroom, the, the closeness that we have to our students and school community that allows us to be the most qualified to be in these spaces. Uh, and it's great that I've been given that opportunity to do some of this work. Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, there should be more teachers, right, to be doing that. And it's not enough. No, not even close to being enough, but just to be in close proximity to elected officials and people who are responsible for creating these policies and, and legislation. 
that impact the work that we try to do in the classroom. I think that's the biggest thing. And I totally agree with you. I think when people look at the teacher of the year honor, they look at it as like pageantry. Like let's, let's just go to these different venues to romanticize the narrative of what teaching is about. Mm -hmm. And even though there's some element of truth to what it is about, we have to, you know, get to the actual issues. Yeah. And, um, one issue that I want to touch on with you is anti-Asian racism. And we know what transpired in Atlanta, you know, so weeks back and some, but even before that, there have been a number of events that have taken place. And what I find sad is the fact that it takes a traumatic event or a tragedy for people to Hiding their awareness about this issue that has been in existence for a long time, mm -hmm. but just hasn't been centered um, in the mass media. So uh, what I want to know from you is how does anti-Asian racism manifest in our K-12 school system? And what are some of the actions that school districts, educators, and I'll even throw in teacher education programs, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they can do to combat this issue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I appreciate you for sort of naming the context of, of why we're having this conversation, but also the fact that these are conversations that people have always been having. Uh, and unfortunately it's the the tragedies that kind of manifest that as, a, as an urgency, right? Yeah. Um, I think like every racial ethnic group in the US has its own unique form of prejudice, discrimination and oppression that they experience. And I was thinking about, well, what is unique about anti-Asian sentiment uh, from you know black and brown, anti-black and brown sentiment? And mm -hmm. I think whereas racism for black and brown people in the United States has historically manifested as subjugation, right? Racism towards Asian people have historically manifested as ostracization, right? That we're other people uh, and that we're constantly excluded. And so with that context, right? Anti-racism in our K to 12 schools oftentimes looks like number one, right? Treating students and educators like this perpetual other, right? When you're Asian America, you're never fully American. Think of the questions that a lot of Asian people are asked, where are you really from? And, and being a perpetual foreigner in your own country also means that folks are less likely to trust you, to see themselves in you, to overlook you for certain positions, especially in leadership, and make assumptions of what it is that you can offer. Uh, so I'm an English teacher and I'm like still to this day, still mistaken for teaching math and science. Uh, and once I corrected a colleague, it was earlier in my career, that I teach English. Uh, and he basically responded, you know, oh, you're fluent. Um, yes, I was born and raised here, right? <laughs> so that kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but the second part that I wanted to say, I think, is this idea of invisibility and erasure. And part of why, like, a lot of those microaggressions can exist is because Asians are a minority within a minority group, right? We're about 5% of the total population. And so that means a lot of Asian students either feel isolated or underrepresented. Uh, and when we experience those microaggressions or explicit forms of racism even, we don't have other Asian people to process that with. And being fewer in numbers means that there are fewer supports. And even in spaces that are culturally responsive and social justice oriented, um, oftentimes, right, Asian people feel like they're forgotten in the conversation um, or, or, or they're never really engaged in the conversation about race to begin with. And that has negative implications. And so. I, I think it's important, right, that we we sort of combat those two themes of invisibility and erasure, making sure that representation and a nuanced understanding of Asian people, but specifically, right, Asian people in America is understood by our educators, and that that's reflected in the ways in which we have discussions around anti-racism, culturally responsive work, uh, but also uh, the type of, you know, curricula, for instance, that we want to make sure that we're diversifying uh, for this population of people. Right. And I want to stay on this for a second because you did mention culturally relevant and anti-racist pedagogy. So what I've come to realize is when people talk about anti-racism, they tend to interchange it with the black experience without centering the other groups that are within that BIPOC acronym. So the indigenous community, the AAPI community, the Latinx community, and we can go on and on. So what I want to know is what should 
culturally relevant and anti-racist pedagogy look and sound like within the API cultural context? So if you're a new teacher or if you're someone that just wants to know what exactly that that would look like in the classroom, what would you tell that person? And obviously there's no checklist, yeah. but just generally, what would yeah. that be? I, I mean, I feel like Kwame, in your framing of the question, when you said that a lot of conversations about race tend to be along this black and white binary, just mm -hmm. acknowledging that and trying to understand everything in between and also outside of those binaries is super important. And I think yes. for the Asian American, you know, the Asian cultural context, uh, part of doing that is also dispelling the model minority myth, right? Uh, and the model minority myth is this idea uh, that Asians are uh, successful academically, socioeconomically, uh, and it's wrong primarily for two reasons. And here's how I think it sort of impacts us in terms of cultural relevant pedagogy and, 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 and anti-racist work, right? Uh, it's the first part being that it assumes that Asians are, for lack of a better term, and I heard this growing up all the time, that we're all the same, right? Uh, and the reality is that Asians aren't a monolith, uh, and educators need to recognize that there's so much diversity within the Asian population. Just in my film analysis club alone, there's like a third of our students are Asian in our, in our club, uh, and they range from students whose parents are Vietnamese refugees uh, to parents uh, to students who are, you know, biracial, uh, to students who are from a specific province in China that is not of the majority, uh, man, uh, you know, uh, Mandarin culture. Uh, and so just kind of acknowledging that every ethnic and racial group is uniquely different and there are linguistic, political uh, considerations to be made if, in terms of how we react to them is important. Uh, and I think secondly, like just knowing that the model minority myth is, is untrue. Uh, and trying to check ourselves when we fall into that uh, mindset, right? Um, you know, even amongst the Asian community, like the Indian American uh, community might enjoy a high or relatively high standard of living. But if you're Laotian or Cambodian or Pakistani or Filipino, right, that stereotype of, of being more successful no longer applies, right? Over a third of Burmese people, for instance, live in poverty. And so when we believe this myth, or if we lean in on that myth, whether we're intentional about it or not, it tends to erase the struggles of those other groups. It makes it harder for us to actually help them. Um, and then I think like, you know, at its core, uh, the model minority myth is not real in that it fails to contextualize uh, our current reality in history, right? History of migration patterns, or even how the systemic disenfranchisement of other minority groups have existed. And so like the origin of the group, uh, term itself is even shrouded in a racist history. And it was used, this idea of Asians being a minor model minority to prop up one model minority group to the detriment of others. And so that's why when we think of Asian stereotypes, right, that we're law-abiding, that we're smart, that we're hardworking, that we're submissive. They're oftentimes in direct opposition to the stereotypes that are used to target BIPOC communities, right? That they're criminal, that they're unintelligent, lazy, aggressive. And so in other words, the model minority myth um, is anti-Black. It's a tool that's used to divide racial groups. And when we should be standing in solidarity against racism and white supremacy, it creates this fake understanding that certain minority groups are different from others when it's totally not the case, right? Um, right. And so I think that's the kind of awareness that teachers first need to know. And it comes from learning about other groups, other racial ethnic groups. And I'm glad you mentioned that because for some of us, we tend to engage in the oppression Olympics, if you will. And yes, even though there are different levels of oppression, uh, whether you look at the indigenous community and, and their erasure and the settler colonialism that's happened, you know, in that regard, but then Latinx community has their narrative, black community has their narrative, and of course the AAPI community has their narrative. At the end of the day, the common denominator is white supremacy. The common denominator is white hegemony. Mm -hmm. That impacts all of us. And just for that fundamental reason, that's why we have to be in solidarity with one another, yep. especially when we talk about anti-racism because, and I, tell this, and I tell people this all the time, we can't be selective in how we engage in this work. You know, we can't just pick and choose who we want to center. Because I know for me as a black man, obviously 
my default is to talk about the black experience, but I also have to acknowledge that I have indigenous brothers and sisters and, and AAPI brothers and sisters and Latinx brothers and sisters who are going through similar struggles and they have their own oppressions they deal with and we have to center it all. But I want to stick with the model minority myth for a second because I know for me, I was a math major in college and I was a math teacher in um, Boston Public Schools. And, you know, everybody always said, oh, you know, person's Asian, oh, they probably got the highest grade. Like, that's a common thing that we hear all the time. Yep. Oh, you know, all Asians are good in math. And and I've met some that are like, no, like, I struggle with it. And I've actually had to tutor some of them. So I know that for So I know for a fact that it's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. But that's the narrative out there. So what I want to know is, how can we create a world? And this is one of my wife's questions. How can we create a world that sees the API community not as a monolith, which you already described, but as a group of unique and historically rich cultures from many countries. And I, and I want to ask you this because when we think about the, the Asian community, we always think about Chinese. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, you're Japanese, right? We, mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then we also talk about, you know, some of the other um, Asian countries, but then there is Myanmar, there's Malaysia, there's Thailand, you know, of course, Vietnam, there's so many countries that don't get that type of attention, but yet there's like those three countries that we hear about all the time. We hear about Vietnam, we hear about Japan, we hear about China. Mm -hmm. So how can we, what can we do to bring light to all the other parts of the Asian community that yeah. also deal with their own share of oppression in yeah. their own way? Yeah, that's a really good question. So kudos to your wife, first of all. Um, but I let her know. <laughs> like you're absolutely right. Even when we talk about Asians, right? People think of East Asians, and so when we think of East Asians, we think of Korean, Japanese, Chinese, right? But even those three languages, completely different geographic regions, uh, completely different language, um, and then like a very complicated historical relation, right? One that intersects with colonialism and imperialism. Um, and so just even by looking at those three countries, there's so much nuance uh, and the need for unpack. And so I think the first implication here is that teachers, educators need to do a better job at understanding the communities that they teach in and what are some of the unique themes, uh, the linguistic, uh, political, uh, socioeconomic challenges that this particular community might be experiencing and using that perhaps as a lens uh, to either see if it uh, aligns with some of the experiences that their Asian students in front of them have or if it doesn't, right? And I think, you know, even to your point about the, the BPS experience that you had with students, you know, being told that they're smart math students, right? I think a lot of people think that just because you say someone is smart or well-behaved, uh, it's a good stereotype and therefore there's no uh, harm being done. But I think the reality is is, is that it kind of flattens us as, as humans, right? In terms of removing who we are as individuals. And 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 there's something so sinister about the, the humanity that's being taken away from us and how that also affects our own socialization. It puts pressures on the kids who don't fit into that stereotype, like the students that you've mentioned. It promotes bullying, right? I can't tell you the number of times that I've been told that the only thing that I've accomplished is because I'm Asian, right? And it stigmatizes a lot of the students who don't really fall under uh, the stereotype. And I think there's a lot of uh, other unseen consequences of that uh, as well. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. We have to make sure that we're talking about race, but we're talking about race uh, in a way that's contextualized to the students' experience. Um, and when we don't do that, uh, and because a lot of our racial conversations are in this black white binary, what happens to a lot of Asian kids is, you know, at best they think that they don't apply to conversations about race and they just check out, right? They're not in solidarity with other communities of color. Um, they think it's a it's a black versus white thing, right? And at worst, they start aligning themselves with whiteness, even though uh, they will never be considered and treated as white people. And so educators have an obligation to talk about how uh, the racialization process occurs in our country and have students process that at an early age. Right. And that doesn't mean you have to know everything there is to know about AAPI, you know, culture. But I just have a story that I want to share, a quick story. So mm -hmm. my last year at the school I was in at BPS, 
I was throwing a cultural infusion party. So I started Donuts Choose project where I was ordering flags based on the origins of, of all of our students in middle school. So we're talking about maybe 200 flags that I ordered through Donuts Choose. And the whole idea was for students to, you know, rep where they're from. So, you know, if you're from a certain country or even more than one country, I'll get you the flags for your respective countries. No problem. Mm -hmm. So, so of course, you know, Boston, you have a huge Vietnamese population, right? So I go ahead and order um, Vietnamese flag. And, you know, there's two different types of flags, which I wasn't aware of at the time. And I think one of the flags uh, represents a, a dark time in the history that mm -hmm. just is tied to war. And what happened was when I ordered um, one of the flags, I think there's one that's like predominantly uh, gold, but then you have like red stripes. And then there's the other one that is the inverse, which would be like red. And then like gold is the secondary color. Okay. So... I can't remember which one I ordered, but what I do remember was when I ordered one of those flags, I think it might've been the the red one. Um, I had my Vietnamese student in my class pull me to the side and he was like, you know, Miss Soft Mensa, you probably weren't aware of this, but you know, that kind of, but this flag ties to a, like a dark part of, of our history. Mm -hmm. And there's and there's a divide within the Vietnamese community. There's some people who do not represent that flag. They prefer like the other flag. So he was giving me a history lesson on that. And I also had a colleague, you know, who's a Vietnamese descent, who was pretty much telling me the same thing. So I think immediately, as soon as I heard that, I was like, all right, I need to fix this immediately. And most teachers would would probably look at it and say, but these are just flags. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the big deal? They're both from the same country. But I think it takes what uh, Yolanda Celia Ruiz calls critical humility to just look at yourself and say, you know what? Like, I messed up. I need to educate myself on just this cultural context and just make amends. And, and that's basically what I did. I just went ahead and got the other flag, gave it to those uh, to the Vietnamese students, and everything was good. Mm -hmm. But that's because I actually took the time to listen. Right. So, so for me, it's about taking the time to listen because a lot of times, you know, we just go ahead and do different things, mm -hmm. thinking that this is what is is this is what our students want. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and I think that's a huge part of education that has to take place. Well, can I also add though, like it's like it's not just listening, but like you following up and asking questions. There was like an innate curiosity into knowing, right, what the student was bringing up to you, and also the fact, right, that the student felt comfortable to say, "Hey, Mister, the way that you've approached this, I appreciate your intent is wrong." Right, but the fact that the student felt safe enough to do that means that already, as an educator, you've already you've been creating a space where, when it comes to identity issues, when it comes to making mistakes related to identity issues, it's a non-issue, right? Like it's something that happens, and it's okay, and we learn and grow from it, right? Uh, and so, like when we talk about these practices, just like what you said, it's not like a checklist issue, but it's almost a mindset that we need to embody. Right. Uh, and that needs to be shown in all of our interactions. And it's about creating a space and being that kind of person for when those um, misunderstandings, right, uh, might occur, when ignorance might come into play, then you have created a space where you can all come together and actually address that because you're aware of these issues and you are aware of how important they are. And it sounds like in your example, you certainly did that. Right. And the only reason why that student was comfortable enough to come to me was because you know we had a really good relationship mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. I do with pretty much most of my students so you start that culture from the very beginning of the, of the class just like you know you know you're a teacher began the school year you set the expectations you create that atmosphere that culture where kids can feel safe and liberated and then from there you get the results of students coming to you and being able to share everything. And, it, and, and it's on that, in that on that day one too, like what you said, right? You set expectations. 
my name is Takeru. Most people can't pronounce that name, right? If I didn't vibe with the teacher on the day on day one because I felt like they wouldn't listen to me, even if I said, "Hey, it's actually pronounced this way," then I wouldn't even have bothered to correct that teacher and how they mispronounced my name, right? But if a teacher is leaning in and creating a space that already feels safe about my identity and respects that and has a way of signaling it, then I would feel comfortable in saying, "Actually, my name is pronounced Takeru," right? And so. Um, you're right. Like that, that kind of stuff is embodied in our practice and it starts as early as possible. So let me ask you this. Do you let people call you TK because you're aware that they might not be able to pronounce Takeru oh. or is that your preference? And, I, and I'm only asking this because as someone that has a very unique name yep. and had a struggle with that through K to 12 and even in high and even in college when I'll be you know, in a lecture hall and the professor's reading the roster and that long 10, 15 minute pause, mm -hmm. I knew it was me. Hey, yep. I'm here. Yep. Like, I'm here. Like, yep. <laughs> no, you know, I, I'm still grappling with it, right? Uh, I go by Takeru Nagayoshi, but I also go by TK is the sort of intro that I usually use. Uh, and, and, and part of it is having to kind of play the game. Um, and, and it's because I realized that people don't remember a Takeru. They don't feel an affinity towards a Takeru. Uh, and when I started, uh, I don't know if branding is the right word, but um, introducing myself in spaces and navigating spaces as TK, it was like night and day. People would better remember me. People would better piggyback off of what I've had to say. People would reference me. Uh, and I don't think it's an intentional, right? People aren't saying, well, this is a foreign name. I don't really have any sort of affinity towards it. Therefore, I'm going to say it less. But at some cognitive level, it happens. TK is something that's easier to stay in your mind. It already has this familiar feel. And I've noticed that it has greater currency in the mouths of other people, specifically white people, when I'm mm -hmm. navigating predominantly white institutions. And so... Part of it is like the politics that I have to play as a person of color to navigate institutional spaces um, where like white cultural norms, right, is the default. Um, and, and and part of it is like, yeah, TK is a cool name. And so I, I like that. But um, it's something that I, I think a lot of students um, also who have uh, ethnic names have to grapple with. And I'm not saying that I feel like this is the answer. I think we can unpack it and talk about the ways in which it is problematic. Um, but it's the weird middle ground that I've settled on at the moment. And so maybe the next time we check in, I'll be going by Takeru. <laughs> and I don't think that's a difficult name to pronounce. I'm only asking. That's why I'm only asking. And I know for myself, whenever I have my new class of students, I'm very adamant telling them, hey, this is my name, Mr. Sarful Mensa. And hell, we'll practice it 50 million times until you get it right. Because I know I'm going to make an effort to pronounce all of your names. Mm -hmm. And if I don't pronounce it correctly, I would like for you to correct me as mm -hmm. many times as you need to. Because I think when we give anybody easy way out, I look at it as us not only being complicit, but also kind of reinforcing these white supremacist norms that already exist within our K-12 system. So I think for me, when I tell my students, hey, this is how you pronounce the name, and I'll write it phonetically if I have to, that's my way of combating against that, just mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. um, so I, but I can understand your struggle too, because it's, it's kind of a dilemma that I think a lot of us go through when we're mm -hmm. dealing with names. So mm -hmm. I was just interested in, in note, oh. wondering. Yeah. I appreciate. I really like this conversation. You know, I used to call it my Starbucks name because for me, it started off as a practicality. Saying that my name is Takeru and the, having the barista write out the name, misspell it, having the order getting mixed up, or then just taking a longer time trying to hear T A K E R U was just impractical for me if I wanted to get my coffee and leave quickly. You know, that's where TK started. But I also understand what you're saying in that, like, it is your name. And we don't have to conform to the linguistic practices of a white dominant majority group culture. Uh, and there is a satisfaction in having a person uh, to having a person struggle with how to pronounce your name and making them say it right. <laughs> uh, and I've also felt that feeling of like, no, you're going to say my name correctly. And I'm not going to move on in this conversation until you do say it correctly. So I do think it, it is sometimes a matter of what spaces we're kind of navigating and how you want to present yourself as that day. Uh, and I definitely uh, have felt 
uh, and have been in, uh, in in how you're approaching the way that you uh, reconcile your name in spaces as well. Right, and I think when you see this microaggression of people repeatedly mispronounce your name, but but I want to contextualize it though, mispronounce your name without really putting the effort of like try, mm -hmm. like saying out the vowels, saying out the different parts of it, breaking it down, using that phonemic awareness, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's the part that's problematic for me. And it goes back to what uh, Dr. Bettina Love says about mattering, like how as people of color, we spend so much time and exert so much energy trying to matter in the society, trying to get people to see us, trying mm -hmm. to get people to affirm us you know, as human. So, you know, when I look at that, I just look at that struggle as just an accumulation of racial stress. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I'm spending all this time trying to get you to say my name correctly. And like, you're not even trying, like you're not really trying. And then you could tell when someone's putting the effort in with someone just like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. what I meant, you know, so no, I yeah, that's that's interesting though. But I, I wanna I wanna switch gears because you know if we're gonna talk about you know intersectionality and we're gonna talk about identity, I wanna talk about you know the LGBTQ plus community because that is a conversation that needs to be had. And one thing that I will say as a middle school math teacher is I cannot tell you the number of kids who have come to me just to say that, you know what, I'm coming out as as queer, I'm coming out as lesbian, I'm coming out as, as this. Mm -hmm. These are my pronouns. Like these are 13, 14 year olds coming to me and saying, this is who I am. And it started a lot earlier too. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I wanna know from you is when, when you came out, what was the response of your family? Because I don't know how to, the response is you know, in Japanese culture, is yeah. it something that is considered taboo or is it one of those things where they're just very receptive and accepting of, of who people are, regardless yeah. of what that identity is? Yeah. I, I, I want to say in Japanese culture attitudes towards LGBTQ plus people is like, ambivalence. <laughs> when I came out to my parents as gay, I was uh, 15 years old. Uh, so it must have been like a sophomore in high school. I think they just didn't know really what to do with me. Um, okay. Because, you know, Japan is not a religious country. And so there's no sort of religious uh, pushback towards being queer. Uh, but also at the same time, there's not like a fully developed, organized, at least, you know, you know, things have changed in the recent decades, but, you know, certainly for my parents' generation, uh, an organized political presence, right? And this identity as being a gay person, a lesbian person, for instance, was just not a concept for my parents. Uh, and so when I came out to them, it was very less about, um, I'm sad or I'm ashamed or I'm frustrated, but more around, I'm, I'm confused, I'm not entirely sure, and you need to help us understand. Um, and I think over the course of the years, uh, they've really come around to it and, 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 and helped um, me, right, come out and, and, and live happy. And then I think at the end of the day, they always wanted to center my joy and my happiness. Uh, and I'm super grateful for that. Um, but yeah, my, um, I think, I, Every culture has its own unique way of understanding identity issues. I think every generation has its own unique way of understanding identity issues. I remember when I first came out to my dad, uh, for him who came to the States in the eighties, being gay was associated with the AIDS epidemic. AIDS, yep. Yep, and so he was terrified that I would, um, you know, get HIV positive or something, right? And so, um, like it's important that when we talk about race or identity or any sort of um, thing that relates to who we are, that we're tapping into conversations and assumptions and perspectives that are not only unique to certain groups and communities, but also along generational lines too. And and being part of this conversation means that you're 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 trying at the very least to be fully aware of all those implications and navigating through them. And and the reason why is because as someone that's you know, been in education for, for 15 years and, and I've had my share of colleagues from the AAPI community and, and I've 
witnessed some of the racism that they've endured, mm. you know, whether it's from other colleagues or even some of the students, you know, with some of the comments they make. When I think about anti-racism and I go back to my original point, how we tend to interchange it with the black experience, right? And, and I think it's for obvious reasons, you know, given the history and the oppression and, and everything that, you know, we've gone through. But I think we have to look at the granular details of that. Like we have to get to a point as educators to be able to walk into a school knowing that there's going to be a diverse classroom in front of you mm -hmm. and be able to get at least, I don't want to say prescription because that just reinforces white supremacy culture. We're not looking for that sense of urgency where we're trying to find the answers. I'm, look, I'm looking at it along the lines of, okay, you know, we have, what does that look like in the API context? How can we support them in this anti-racism movement? How can we support black people in this anti-racism movement? How can we support indigenous people in this anti-racism movement? How can we support, um, you know, Latinx people in this anti-racism movement? Because of the diverse histories, there are different things that we have to point out there. So you mentioned the, min the model minority myth. That is something that is big regardless of where you fall within the AAPI community. That's just something that just is kind of normalized, right? And then even with you know, the indigenous community, we always talk about the fact that land acknowledgements have to happen. And it doesn't matter what tribe you're from, but you have to acknowledge the lands that you stand on, that you occupy. Mm -hmm. So there are certain things that we can start to do to affirm the lived experiences of each of the different racial groups, even, the, even with all the intersectionality that's involved and the diversity involved. Mm -hmm. there's, still, there's still some things that we can we can do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as you were sharing, of, you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking about it's so hard being a teacher and, and, and enacting what you've said, because I think part of being a teacher is that you are confined to the structure of our school and our schools are designed to be right. so transactional. And for those moments of deep and complex interrogation of who we are and how we come together as a pluralistic diverse community don't exist often outside of an academic context and it's nice to say right well that's why culturally responsive anti-pedagogical practices should be incorporated into our lesson so that you know students see themselves and see others uh, reflected in their learning um, but a part of me is also wondering if part of the issue is the design of how schools are made. And it's 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 created in a way where meaningful, in-depth, enduring conversations and opportunities for us to learn about each other, to have conversations like this, right, right now, um, are non-existent or can only exist outside of the traditional structure, right, of, of, of the school um, system. And so, yeah, I, I think I struggle with that question of, well, like, how do we, because, I'm doing the best that I can as a teacher, but I'm also a teacher, right? Who has to focus on the academic output of our students and trying to reconcile all of the things that you've mentioned and, and all of the awarenesses that we need to have and all of the in-depth conversations that I wanna have with my students with the reality that they need to pass MCAS, that they need to pass the grade, that they wow. need to pass the P exams is just a hard balance to make. No, it is, and as someone that's has been that same system, you know, MCAS is pretty much the Super Bowl for us because that ties back to accountability, whether it's from just an educator perspective or just from a whole school perspective. Mm -hmm. People just look at the data. They want to see the growth. All these different arbitrary measures that we use to assess how far a kid has grown from a year to year basis. But you you mentioned something that actually that actually goes back to something that to a frustration you had, and I actually I actually saw the post so on Facebook. Okay, it was it was after the the after the um, events in Atlanta, mm -hmm. um, and I believe maybe it was a few days afterward your school is doing some uh, PD training. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. We had a whole day PD training. Yeah. They get this was implicit bias. Uh, and not once <laughs> uh, did our school leaders, uh, did other educators, right, mention the fact that, you know, here's all the crap that's happening right now in the world, right, as it relates to the specific population. Uh, and I felt it was tone deaf. Uh, I felt mm. like it was a good example of how a lot of uh, cultural responsive conversations can be made into just a thing that we do and not a thing that we live by. Uh, and that there are a lot of blind spots, right, uh, in in how we talk about these issues. And, and, and part of that is, you know, uh, how Asian people are oftentimes not considered this broader conversation of um, racial solidarity and uh, uh, anti-racist work. Uh, and so I, yeah, I was in my field. Uh, I, I made a post about it. Uh, I think the tone initially was pretty accusatory. And I said, you know, here's all the things that administrators could have done and said to signal solidarity and support and love and compassion for API students and API, you know, educators and community members. And none of this happened, right? Um, but then, you know, my administrator reached out to me um, and you know, God bless her. She's, 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 she's amazing. She's done incredible work to push forth the conversation of implicit bias at our school. Uh, and she's, you know, owned up to some of the blind spots that this work has. And we literally spent uh, two hours on the phone just talking about like the impact of this and, and some of the difficulties and the burdens, right? Uh, that that people of color oftentimes have in navigating and pushing forth this conversation. And uh, this administrator uh, is a white woman, right? Uh, but she's gay uh, and also has felt at points the pressures of, of pushing forth identity related conversations in institutions where either that skill set is not there or the mm -hmm. interest is, you know, superficial at best. Um, and and we were really aware of that, this uncomfortable conversation that she and I had because she wanted to talk about that post that I made that indirectly subtweeted her, right? As uncomfortable as it was, it was one of the conversations that really pushed us forth as professionals and how we wanna hold one another accountable in doing this kind of work. And it was just unfortunate that like, that's not a conversation that we can have to scale or just do away at a, at a training, you know? Yeah, but big shout out to your um, administrator because if the average administrator saw that post, it would have been straight Delete. representative <laughs> educator. There'll be some repercussions, some negative repercussions. So the mm -hmm. fact that she put her ego to the side and said, hey, TK, let's have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Let's unpack this post. I want to know how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. that's a, that's a huge step. Mm -hmm. That's a very huge step. And when you talk about empathy, I would like to say that all of our school leaders have that um, element of empathy in them, but they don't always bring it out, particularly in situations like, like this one. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I brought up that post because I just think about how, we internalize so much of of these of this trauma that we endure, this racial trauma, in order for us to show up for our students, right? How we have to deal with the performative allyship, if you will, from colleagues, from superintendents, administrators, and yet we still are charged with the responsibility to show up for students each and every day. Just mm -hmm having to compartmentalize all that to still do our job. People look at it as a badge of honor in our profession, but over time, it actually is something that takes its toll yep. physically, mentally, and psychologically. And we have to find a way to debunk this, this myth of uh, like paternalism that just happens in our in our profession where we got to be the hero and we, we, we don't need anybody. We got this. Like, mm -hmm. we have to debunk that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just be okay with saying, actually, I still have a lot to learn, so I'm not going to join this conversation, right? Uh, which is something I found myself do. Uh, and then also, well, if you are asking for my expertise, if you are asking for my input, right? Uh, what kind of space um, is that coming from, right? Do you, is it, uh, are you really honoring my voice uh, and my thoughts in a way uh, that 
you know, if, if, if you do, right, is there compensation involved? Because I don't want my labor and my insight uh, always being taken for granted. Uh, and I think it's telling when uh, school leaders or education organizations or program uh, only go to teachers of color when a race related incident happens and seldom look at the ways in which we offer uh, value to our systems outside of that identity context. And so, you know, on one hand, it is a reflection of, well, there's a dearth of that skill set. And so as people of color, you know, as a gay man, for instance, uh, I can speak to that in my role as a teacher. And, and I want to because I think it's important. But on the other, if that is the only way I'm being looked at, through, right, in terms of what I have to offer and value, it is dehumanizing um, as well. And so like, how do I uh, try to balance those two truths while also looking out for my own social emotional health uh, and not feeling like I need to be a martyr, right, uh, to speak on these issues because I don't have all the answers and I'm also learning. It would just be nice if other folks who are asking me would, would do some of that work to learn on their own too, you know? Totally agree. Uh, totally agree. And that applies to any any racial group, right? Like we, we all go through that where they ask the question and then everybody's neck turns towards you. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think? What do you think, TK? What do you think uh, we should do? Well, what are your I, thoughts on this? How do you feel when that happens to you? Um, I feel infuriated. But you get to a point where you almost expect it to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely not a, a good feeling to have. That's not something that you want to do. You don't want to get used to this. Mm. You definitely don't want to fall into this place of indifference. Mm -hmm. No matter how many times it happens. Because I think when we fall into indifference, we then become complicit. Mm -hmm. Because then it's like, you know, we don't really care. We become apathetic towards what happens. Not that we don't care, but it's like it's happened so much. We don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. We just feel like, all right, it's just going to keep on happening. So after a while, just like, man, F it. I can't. Ain't, ain't yeah. nothing else I can really say about this. They're not, they're not getting it. Yeah. But that's not the right attitude to have. So I definitely don't want to um, recommend that approach to anybody. <laughs> But it's real, right? Like we yeah. are in some cases also desensitized and numb to the fact that the points that we're going to make when, you know, are, are repeated points that we have been making and it hasn't made a difference. Um, and so, yeah, it almost feels like we're parroting the things that we've said before. And, you know, you want to authenticate your passion and, and, and how you're feeling. But like at the same time, you shouldn't be putting your pain uh, on display for other people to believe what you have to say. And, and I think a lot of people of color, especially, you know, black, indigenous, brown uh, people of color are put into that position, right? To constantly have to display their pain and their trauma in order for other people to really understand and listen to what they have to say. And the fact that that's continual does wear at you. And that's real. And that's how racial fatigue happens. Mm -hmm. That's how it happens. When you look at all the different leaders, revolutionaries, I don't care what group you look at, they all had to deal with their bouts of racial fatigue. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why so many of them died so early in their lives. Because by having to keep pushing and pushing towards systemic change, that accelerated their aging process. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they're dead by the time they reach 50 or 40. Like Martin Luther King was dead at 39 years old. But when you looked at him, he didn't look 39. He looked so much older. Why? Because of the constant pushing and and just um, amplifying that he was doing, you know, during mm -hmm. that civil rights era. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely tough. All right. So we're approaching the hour. I want to ship gears to the lightning round. Okay. Finish strong, right? So let's get to know TK. So first question I have is, with all the work you're doing within your classroom and even outside the classroom, how do you exercise self-care? What's that favorite self-care activity that you're doing right now? I vent a lot. 
uh, especially to my partner. Good self care for me, not good for him. <laughs> <laughs> so venting. All right. Yeah. Uh, what is your biggest pet peeve? Toxic positivity, especially in education spaces. Everyone's always like, just be nice and kind to one another. And that's not how we address systemic issues. All right. And is there a book that you're currently reading? I just finished um, Crucial Conversations, um, which is an interesting book. It was for a book club that I read. Uh, it talks about like when stakes are high, how to sort of de-escalate those situations. Um, it didn't have an analysis of like race and identity and how sometimes that plays a role in the conversations that you have. So that's my critique there. And uh, then I'm teaching a grad school course uh, for like education policy related issues. And so I'm rereading The Teacher Wars uh, by Dana Goldstein. And this talks about how the purpose of the public school teacher has shifted over time. So it's a pretty cool book. Recommend it. Oh, awesome. Wait, do you say you're teaching a, a grad course? Yes, at Northeastern. Oh, nice. All right. Awesome. Awesome. You know, as a matter of fact, I have a Northeastern story. I actually applied for the for the doctoral program maybe uh -huh. a, over a year ago. Uh, I think it's for the uh, curriculum, the curriculum instruction program, the EDD one. But I, I said, I don't know. I, I'm kind of at a place now where I don't know if I have the, the stamina to even do a doctoral program as interesting as that is. So, Hey, that yeah. fatigue that we talked about, right? It affects <laughs> too. Yeah, but it's something that I always go back and forth with. So, you know, that's my Northeastern story. All right. If you can invite three influential figures, dead or alive, to dinner, who would they be? I just want to say dinner with anyone at this point would be nice. Um, but probably my grandparents. Uh, so my my maternal grandmother is still alive. She's 90. I haven't seen her in a long time. I, I just want to have dinner with her. Uh, and then my paternal grandparents, uh, they died before I was born. And so I, you know, be curious to know a little bit about them and be in touch with my heritage that way. All right. Um, if you weren't working in education and if this wasn't your career, what would you be doing right now? Do you have like oh, a dream career? Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I want to like do something creative. Um, like, I don't know, write stories or help produce a story. But in high school, I always wanted to go into law or government. But I don't know mm. if that, because that was like an acceptable answer or it's what I truly wanted to do. I'm always like figuring out what I want to be. I will. It's always great to be in the exploratory phase. Yeah. Yeah, this is cool. You, you you create your own path, right? Because sometimes the paths that are laid for you are, are, are I don't know if I can curse, but, you know, crap. <laughs> All right. Um, and I was thinking, too, I think sometimes there are seasons for when you do different things. So maybe right now it's what you do in the classroom. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, that's the next question I want to ask you because you're doing so much stuff right now. You're still teaching full time um, in the classroom. And then you're also doing all this work with, you know, different organizations trying to raise awareness and trying to do your part to um, amplify and dismantle, you know, some of the issues within our education system. I just want to know what does the future look like for you? Cause yeah. you have so much going on. Like, what does that look like for you? Uh, I don't know, man. Um, you know, I still want to be in the classroom. I think next year I'm going to go back into the classroom because I felt like my full year of teaching has been robbed and, and I want to experience, you know, I don't want to say post pandemic, but like, you know, post current version of pandemic of a uh, classroom where I can have an actual school community and connect with my students in, in deeper ways that I wasn't able to this year. Um, but then after that, I don't know. Um, I, I, I know I want to stay in education. I know that a lot of my frustrations are in the fact that um, the issues that I'm noticing, you know, that manifest in the classroom are, are more systemic. And so I think I want to be in positions that can affect broader systems related change. Oh, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, there are times where 
I just struggle with it myself. You know, you love the kids so much and that's what always is going to bring you back into that classroom space. Yeah. But at the same time, you hesitate because of the politics that you just mentioned. Um, but I think, you know, with, with regard to that, it's, it's just a, it's just a tough dilemma. It really is. It's yeah. tough. Yeah. Yeah. Also just like world right now is so uncertain that just the mere idea of figuring out what your next step is like anxiety provoking for me. And mm -hmm. so it's on this sort of autopilot mode where I work and I love the engagements that I do because they're just wonderful ways of processing the things that I do in the classroom and the relationships that I have with my students in a more externally oriented way where I get to talk about my practice, where I get to talk about my thinking and to process that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think, um, and so right now I'm happy that I get to traverse this medium limbo space of being in the classroom uh, and then sourcing uh, the classroom experiences that I have as inspiration for the advocacy work that I do but it's not sustainable. It's like having two jobs. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And you know, part of, you, you said I got into a car accident. Well, that's because I was, you know, at school until 10 o'clock at night <laughs> um, and I was tired. Right. And, and even though it was a car that crashed into me um, and I wasn't at fault, it still made me realize like, well, why the hell were you at school until 10 o'clock anyway? You know, why? And, and I have been feeling burnt out and I have been feeling uh, a little jaded <laughs> at times. And so, you know, I think the next chapter I'll start centering my own personal self-care a little bit more. So more venting perhaps. Hey, if that's what you do for self-care, you know, more power to you. So based on your answer, I'm assuming that in New Bedford, the plan for uh, 2021, 2022 is to be back in school for in-person learning. Is that? I hope so. It's not entirely clear yet. You know, it's one okay. of those where they don't tell you until like a month before and we're kind of looking at what other districts are doing. So yep. no clarity. Yeah. yeah. That's how it is with, with all the districts. And then it's like no days, right? Yep. <laughs> no, yep. For sure. Uh, definitely for sure. Uh, but TK, man, I appreciate you for coming on to the podcast. Um, definitely enjoy the conversation. And, and this is something that we definitely need to continue just yeah. in general. We need to, continue to center our API brothers and sisters and and really put that in the forefront along with all the other narratives out there. So let people know how they can connect with you uh, via social media and, and just to support all the great work you're doing. So let them know how they can con contact you. Yeah. Uh, feel free to follow me on Facebook uh, or add me on Facebook uh, and LinkedIn. It's my full name, Takeru Nagayoshi. Uh, I use a lot of Twitter though. So TK uh, underscore Nagayoshi at TK underscore Nagayoshi, right? Uh, you can find me there. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, when I'm feeling a little uh, sassy, I make a post or two. So. Oh, juicy. All right. Like that. <laughs> All right. Well, TK, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. And we're going to make sure you, you get some rest. Cause I know you've, you've been doing a lot during your break. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. All right. All right, take care. All right, people, that is a wrap. Another excellent conversation and episode of the I Dane Talk Educators Live podcast. And as I always tell you all, I wish you a good morning, good night, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And we're going to do this again another time. Peace out, everybody. <laughs>